Welcome to All Strut No Fret One Shots. I'm Dr. Anna Camarali and this is the series where I drink a shot and then I get one shot at telling you the entire plot of an early modern play, no cuts, no edits. Today the shot is this ill-advised mango flavoured vodka. I know I bought this myself so it must be one of those seemed like a good idea at the time things and the play is the very famous The Man of Mode by George Etheridge so we're back on our restoration comedy kick here. Now The Man of Mode centres on one gentleman, Dorimon. Now he is a rake and one thing you need to know to understand restoration comedies is they love their stock characters. Now the, this play was particularly famous because Dorimont was supposedly modelled on the real life rake John Wilmot the Earl of Rochester but since the Earl of Rochester kind of modelled himself on the stereotype of the rake the point is really moot. He could have been anybody. We open seeing Dorimond getting information from some servant types about a, a, a new potential conquest in town, a young woman who has been brought to London by her mother with uh, good fortune in search of a decent match. Uh, Dorimont already is burdened with more than one mistress. He's in the middle of trying to shed one in order to be able to spend more time with the other. He's been seen with the new mistress at the theatre, but, and here's a key point, she was masked. Now, one really confusing thing for a modern reader looking at restoration plays is the constant reference to some to a mask. They keep saying things like, I saw you at the theatre in a box with a mask. And it didn't mean a mask that he himself was uh, carrying or wearing. Uh, the mask refers to the girl who was with him, who was wearing a plain black velvet mask, which is what proper young ladies did at uh, in public spaces if they didn't want to be recognised or acknowledged. So this is all information that we're uh, hastily uh, given in the very first scene, first by the servant figures and then by uh, Dorimont's annoying sidekick, Medley. Uh, notice his name there. Uh, he is a meddler. You're going to see a lot of what's called aptronyms in this play. So people are going to have names that describe the kind of character they are. And Medley doesn't really have any function in the plot except delivering lots and lots and lots of exposition when we need it. And then the next person to show up is a chap called Young Bel Air. Now he is our innocent, uh, less duplicitous young lover and he is simply in love with a lovely girl called Amelia and his problem is that his father wants to marry a different girl who he hasn't met yet who turns out to be the one Doramont has just been hearing about who is new to town. Her name turns out to be Harriet but we don't meet her for a while yet. So uh, young Belair's problem is that uh, he is having his marriage arranged for him with a girl that he uh, he knows he doesn't want to marry because he loves Amelia. And so that whole first act is really just a an information dump setting up all those intrigues. Uh, the second act then goes on to introduce us to some of the people that we've heard spoken of. First of all, we get to meet Amelia and she is under the protection of Lady Townley. You're going to find there's a Lady Townley and a Lady Woodville because there's a lot of jokes in the show about the difference between country people and city people and mostly at the expense of laughing at the simplicity of country people. So Amelia is being looked after by Lady Townley and she complains that uh, her fiancé, young Belair's father, who is not aware that she's engaged to his son, is hitting on her himself and it's just you know the kind of guy uh, she says about this old man he calls me rogue and says he will not abide me and he does so bepat me Ugh. we yeah we know his sort and Mrs Townley says don't worry we'll get this all sorted out for you and then uh gradually more and more people show up and we start to meet people like the um the 
jilted lovers of uh, uh, of Doramont. Uh, you see, we go to meet uh, Mrs. Lovett, who is, is the lover he's trying to get rid of, and Belinda shows up. She's a new lover, but no one knows that yet, and she tries to just plant information that um, Doramont is being untrue to her without actually revealing that it's with her. Then Doramont shows up, he's really mean to Mrs. Lovett. Oh, um, one thing to note about these scripts is you'll see Mrs. written in front of a lot of women whether or not they're married. It's actually short for mistress, so it's better just to say mistress and it doesn't indicate her marital status, a little quirk of the time. So after seeing Doramont be so mean to Mrs. Lovett, Belinda reflects on the fact that she is beginning to suspect that she'll be thrown over too when her time comes. And let's face it, the actor you get to play Doramont is going to have to be stupid handsome because otherwise no one will put up with this nonsense from him. So finally we get to meet Harriet who is in town with her from the country with her mother Mrs Woodville and uh, we hear about the fact that she has been hearing so much intriguing and dodgy stuff about Doramont that she is torn between being uh, repulsed by his reputation and intriguingly attracted to him. What a surprise. Uh, so we finally meet Harriet. They introduce her to the man she's supposed to get married to, young Bel Air, and those two are really adorable together because they very quickly establish that neither of them want, wants to marry each other. But in a, a, a quite adorable scene where they're in sight but not in earshot of their chaperones, uh, they pretend to be falling madly in love with each other when they're actually giving each other instructions on how to stand, how to look, how to hold a fan in order to give the impression that they're, uh, that they're courting when they're really not. So those two are actually kind of a delight. Now, uh, we are already up to Act 3, believe it or not, and all we've done up to now is just meet a lot of people. It's one of those plays where there's so much plot, it's almost like there's no plot at all. We finally meet the uh, eponymous uh, character, the, the character referred to in the title, Sir Fopling Flutter, who is, as you may have picked up from the name, a stock character from this period called the Fop. Now, Fop is always very aristocratic. His problem is that he is too fashionable. So a rake like Doramont will definitely be fashionable. He will be well-dressed. He will be well-groomed. Um, there's a tendency these days to play rakes as dishevelled, and that's in order to set them up as a contrast to a fop. But that's just because we have so little patience these days for men who take care of their appearance. Isn't that a tragedy? So the problem with a fop like Sir Fopling Flutter is that he has been too influenced by his time in Paris and therefore is uh, empty-headed and affected and full of frivolous empty manners and lace cuffs and lots of snuff, that sort of thing. So all that happens now is that pretty much everyone we've met so far is manoeuvred to meet together walking outside at the Mall. The Mall is a big, wide, open stretch of ground from uh, walking from park to park in London where the fashionable go to see and be seen. So bang in the middle of Act 3, we all show up at the Mall. And what happens uh, while we're there is Doramont has an exceedingly complicated strategy that he's going to get Mistress Lover, who he doesn't want anymore, to flirt with Sir Fopling in order to try to make him jealous, which will actually be useful to him because it'll give him an excuse to ditch her. Um, Belinda's really just watching all this, uh, wondering how her story with him is going to play out. Then we have, um, but Doramont really wants to get to know Harriet, who is quite intrigued by now, and she and he trade a lot of witty barbs and the problem with this play is there is so much witty banter but you, it's so full of archaic expressions and minuscule idiosyncratic references to things going on in town at the time it's almost impossible to sort of plow your way through it to get to what's going on but they snark at each other for a bit uh, while barely suppressing their obvious mutual attraction 
but their problem is going to be that Harriet's mother has heard Dorimont's reputation and doesn't want her daughter to have anything to do with him. So he gets introduced to her mother under a different name. So they have the opportunity to hang out together uh, and disparage the terrible Dorimont without uh, the truth or the fact of his presence getting in the way. Uh, so that all seems to work for everyone at the Mall. There's a lot of uh, chatting and back and forth and intrigue and walking up and down and that's about it and that's the big central scene in the mail. Now we then go on to discover Belinda later on uh, revealed at an inappropriate hour in Dorimont's residence and in a state of déshabillé, so semi-dress. So we know that she's sleeping with him now which is a big problem for an unmarried woman and next thing you know what happens is of course all his male friends, Medley, so Fopling, one after the other, all start turning up at Dorimont's apartment and somehow he has to get Belinda out by the back door and in such a way that no one is aware that her reputation has been compromised. So there's lots of running around and to do, but they manage to, um, to achieve that. Also, we see a scene at Mrs Lovett's house where there is much back and forth of... Uh, young Belair having to disguise his uh, impending marriage to Amelia because his father has threatened that if he doesn't marry Harriet as he's supposed to, then he himself, old Belair, will marry a young bride, have a new family and disown his son. That's his plan. So there's, again, more fussing about the fact that uh, the young folk are supposed to marry certain people but would rather marry other people. All we have left to happen then is a very straightforward denouement in Act 5 where basically Amelia and Belair simply find themselves a minister and marry uh, with the support of Lady Townley who's perfectly delighted that they should be a couple and then everyone gradually makes their way to one place, to Mrs Townley's residence and old Belair has it revealed that he has lost his Amelia and his son because they are married now. He's initially furious, but he comes around to it. And it is revealed to Harriet's mother that the man she thought was a perfectly nice chap who she could say scandalous things about Dorimont to actually is Dorimont. But uh, because of her love for her daughter, she too is brought around to the idea that Dorimont and Harriet now plan to marry. And so Fopling Flutter, who has been somewhat courting Mrs Lovett, who actually thinks he's just a joke, um, she makes a fuss and flounces out and he says, well, that's actually fine because I don't want to court just one woman. My plan is to charm all the women of the town and never has a title character has so little effect on the plot. And that's it for the man of mode. So you have to, in order to appreciate this play, enjoy simply assuming that all kinds of pretty people figuring out who they're going to bed is going to keep us all busy and watching for uh, long enough to enjoy a play. It's going to be very confusing on the page because there are just so many lovely young women. But if you imagine that we are talking about a stage production, what you would probably do is colour code them nice and strongly in di very different dresses and that would help you keep them straight. There are a few archaic uh, expressions through it that it will help you if you understand. You need to know if someone orders a chair that means a sedan chair, which was a, a public transport where you sit in an enclosed box and get carried around by two footmen. Uh, that a mask, as I mentioned, is uh, can be used to refer to a woman wearing a mask in order to conceal her identity in a public place. It helps if you know that to want something is not to desire it, but rather to lack it. Uh, it helps to know that gloves were perfumed, that fans were used by all as means of communication, and that a closet is still a small private room and not a cupboard. And mostly it helps if you appreciate that there's nothing wrong with spending a couple of hours on stage looking at a whole lot of very pretty nonsense.